and there's participants and everything. Um, okay, so this is lecture two, uh, basically trying to well, explain a bit more about key learning, some of the challenges with it, and a proposal to try to, to solve it based on some well-known ideas. Um, so a lot of this is sort of review, you know, we this connection between optical control and RL, we just said it, I'll just remind you of that. This idea of, of going from dynamic programming to an LP, you know, you've already seen that by Mengdi in her lecture. I think it's other people have talked about it. Old, old news, okay? Um, but then uh, from that, you get to something that, you know, we just made up this name, Convex Q Learning. Um, and uh, basically, so my intention is to give a tutorial on on these sort of uh, convex analytic methods for dynamic programming and how they potentially could be applied to reinforcement learning. All right. And this has a long history, not just in operations research, but in the control community as well. Um, so I, I'm using the same one. Oh. Um, so anyway, we saw this already that um, if you have a, uh, a total cost optimization problem like this, this would apply, for example, to the mountain car problem where once you get to the top of the hill, you stop and the cost is zero. Um, okay. Uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. There yeah. is something wrong with the slides. I, I don't think that they are forwarding. Maybe oh, you have to. Oh, oh, oh. Hold on one second, guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to. I see the cursor moving. Interesting. I'm going to stop and restart. Yeah. Um, try this again. Let's see. Can you see this and this? Yep. All right. Okay. So basically, yeah. So a lot of so the first two parts of this will be mainly things you've seen before. Um, but some things I don't know. So, so some things here I don't even know if they're new or not, because um, there's a lot I don't know about DQN, for example. So hopefully some people help me out. Um, so we saw this before. That say for total cost optimization, optimal control problem, we have this DP equation, and as somebody was hinting at, there'd be a conditional expectation if this was a Markovian model. One of my intentions of doing everything deterministically is that the concepts carry over to the stochastic case without that much trouble. I mean, there's this technicalities, of course, but the concepts carry over really nicely. Um, and so we have, we know we have a DP equation for Q by introducing this notation. You know, it, it, Whenever you see an underbar, it just means a minimum. Um, and uh, that's the thing we'd like to solve. So that's just a review from last uh, lecture. Um, so, Again, you know, again, and also this model free representation. Um, so, so basically, in, in Q learning, we would like to find the theta that gives us the smallest Bellman error in some sense, and we need a criteria for success. And that's going to be one big part of today's of this lecture: is how do we decide what's a good approximation? Uh, you know, what does it mean to be close to zero? All right. Okay. All right. Um, and so let me just review the temple difference methods first that we know and love. Um, so, you know, you can basically um, do the same thing I talked about using a um, a fixed policy Q function. And so, I'm, not, I, I'm sorry I don't have the whole history, but I mean, this is a standard technique in reinforcement learning is to get, be given initial policy, approximate um, the Q function, the fixed policy Q function, um, and then uh, update your policy. So your new policy is defined to be the argument here. So if you solve this exactly, then that's policy iteration and it'll converge and, and you're, there's all sorts of monotonicity properties. It's awesome. Um, yeah, um, but the thing is, if you want to do an approximation, you again use this fact that for the true, um, the true fixed policy Q function, uh, it's just observed, and uh, so it's clear that you have all sorts of algorithms. And Sutton was the 
the god of this, you know, came up with all sorts of insights on how to approximate this function before, I oh, know, well before Watkins, suddenly Bartow did it. Um, and um, so again, we have the same goal. Um, so the, um, so this, you know, this beautiful temple difference thing, um, you know, it's been recognized forever again, early eighties uh, by uh, Bartow and Sutton and others. Um, so, so basically I had this expression for the, this is my Bellman error. And we can keep the same notation if I change my notation here. So just for the next few slides, when I write down underbar, you know, I'm really meaning substitution. <laughs> All right. So it's just a way to keep the same notation. All right. And um, yeah, it's like restricting my action space to one, <laughs> one action. <laughs> it's my policy. All right. So, um, you know, I'm going to still call it TD learning. Somebody later tell me if I can get into trouble for that. Uh, but I'm just going to call it TD Lambda, even though people call it SARSA, because basically, if you're trying to estimate the Q function in this context, you're just viewing XK and UK as a joint state process. And so it really is TD Lambda for a larger state process. And I, I suspect that's why the SARSA paper never really got published, because it really, it really is just TD Lambda applied to a different uh, realization of the state. Okay, so we've got our eligibility vector here. And um, we try to find the zeros of this function. And uh, we have to choose this eligibility vector. And we set that equal to zero. And that's the TD lambda. And I'll explain. Um, so TD zero, I will, I will define this as taking the gradient of the Q function. I think most would agree um, that that's, that's the definition of TD zero. That's the choice of the eligibility vector right there. And in TD lambda, you do the same thing, but you pass this through a low pass filter with parameter lambda. Okay, so lambda is between zero and one. And here, well, I'll write less than equal to one. That's a bit dangerous in general, um, but there you have it. So, so there's TD zero and TD lambda. And the theory around this is beautiful. And I first learned about this from Ben Venor's thesis, which is an absolute manifesto. It's the most beautiful thesis. So um, that's why I first learned about it. That's my, that's just, just the trajectory I took. That wasn't the optimal trajectory, but it's a fantastic thesis. Um, and so basically, you know, you don't have to do this, everybody. I mean, you know, basically one could write an ODE. In this case, I wouldn't recommend it. Just go straight to the algorithm um, necessarily, we'll see. Um, and you know, the gain here, you know, you can put in a matrix gain if, it, if you find it could be useful. I'm just saying it's an option. Um, and, um, but, but you see what I'm doing here, everybody. I've got an objective. By objective, you know, I have, well, I could say step zero is that I want to solve F bar of theta star equals zero, right? And then step one is to say, well, maybe this ODE will get me to that solution. Maybe the ODE converges. And if it does, then I have this step two where I can do the stochastic approximation or QSA um, approximation, which is just like an Euler scheme. So that's it. All right. All right. So there it is. And then uh, so that's, that's, that's TD lambda. And then there's least squares temporal difference learning um, where I'll explain it. It doesn't have to be. I'll explain it for linear parameterization, where Q theta is just a linear combination of, uh, of features. Um, you could just look at an average over horizon T uh, of this eligibility vector times the Bellman error. And it just becomes a linear function of theta. Just invert and you've solved it. All right. All right, so those are two options. All right, and uh, here's a beautiful fact. I think everyone knows this here, that LSTD is the same as this approach if you choose a special gain. You just take GN to be minus A and inverse. You know, the difference is one over N squared or something. And it's, not, I mean, if, well, again, and alpha N plus one equals one over N plus one, I should say that. <laughs> uh, under those restrictions, 
these are the same algorithms depend, I mean, maybe with an error of one over n plus one squared if you don't do things just right, All right? Cool, so, um, so there's that. Um, now, here's the thing, I mean, uh, these whole four hours I'm cheating you because I'm not talking about exploration and I just don't have time for it. Here in the control community, they would call it persistence of excitation, right? And in order to get this persistence of excitation condition, again, I'm taking I'm taking a linear parameterization for the Q function. Um, to get this persistence of excitation condition, you're very surely going to need, especially for a deterministic control problem, to have something like a randomized policy where this uh, CK, for me, it's going to be a mixture of sinusoids. If you want, it could be IID, a, a random noise, or something like that. Now, you all, all experts, I know that's not the best way to do things, okay? I'm just, Exploration is a different topic, a very important topic. I, mean, I just can't dive into that. There's no, no time. All right. Um, so, um, so basically, what I'm actually describing here is um, this is off policy, which is known to have problems, but it's, it's known that uh, this matrix does uh, for n sufficiently large. Uh, for most d values of lambda, so that's 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 been known for for quite a while now. Um, but and also it's known. Don't, don't yell at me yet. That TD one solves this amazing minimum norm problem. So I look at the norm between Q theta and Q star, the real Q function, um, in the pi norm. I want to find pi. <laughs> pi is not a policy. Under conditions. Um, and the condition is for on policy, <laughs> which is so for deterministic problems, you really got a problem, you know, because <laughs> you can't do the randomized policies. And so, you know, I won't get into the details of what people actually do, but um, clearly you all can see the trouble for deterministic problem where your goal is to reach an equilibrium and stay there. You know, everything's going to zero, you know, this, I mean, this is going to some equilibrium as k goes to infinity. So it's just, there's no way you can get this without exploration, without shaking the system. All right, so um, TD learning methods are wonderful, but you know, they take some care in, in implementation, but they work beautifully. You know, they, this, this approach has had incredible success. All right, um, one approach to resolving this is using on policy in a deterministic setting and periodically resetting. So basically stop the problem and you, the, the, the exploration is for the initial condition. You sort of restart the system in a new initial condition, run again, restart and restart. And that, that potentially uh, can resolve this, okay? I'm not gonna get into that. Now, a question is B. So I used to think this was the goal and that was only my oh, my math brain talking. Now for actor critic, yes, as you, you, you've seen. Um, but I'm gonna tell you why I was wrong. <laughs> this is not the compelling goal in general, you know. Um, so TD1, outside of actor critic methods, is really not that, a con this, this goal is really not so compelling outside of uh, actor critic methods. I, I will explain why I feel that way in a bit, okay? All right, so, um, so, this, so another approach is a generalization of Watkins algorithm, which is very popular. I don't know the name for it, so I'm gonna call it Q0 learning. Don't tell me now if this is, if it's a standard name, tell me later. Um, but you run Watkins algorithm with a, a function approximation setting. Um, and, and, and everything, just copy and paste TD0, and we'll call it Q, Q0 in this lecture. Uh, so again, as we saw before, we have a model-free representation. We've seen that. Um, we have our F bar, F bar, um, 
our goal That's step zero is to identify your goal. And in this case, our goal is a scalarian relaxation of, uh, of the uh, Belbin equations. Um, and, uh, and this is a very, very common approach in the RL community. It's just to take this eligibility vector there to be the gradient of the Q function. Okay. I, think that's, I think that's pretty standard. Okay, so again, the design principle is the same. So I'm not going to write it down. Um, you you analyze an ODE, see if it's stable, and that can be really hard. That's a really big research topic, you know. I have an awful sufficient condition with that people often cite. I wish you wouldn't cite it, <laughs> um, and it's been improved slowly. But uh, no, it's just it's just. This is a really difficult problem, um, getting an OD that's stable. Um, but once you get a stable algorithm, then you go through and use an Euler approximation and stochastic approximation, and you've got an algorithm. Okay. Um, but one thing I want to ask, and I really want to challenge everybody, is why is this really a, anything we would ever care about anyway? You know, that was step zero. Why did I make that step zero? I mean, I don't have any, so for TD learning, there's such beautiful theory to explain the motivation. For Q learning, it's much, much more fragile. So I want to try to have a debate about this topic. And I'll, I'll I, I, luckily Michelle, I got a, a, yeah. Is it easy to explain uh, what is the beautiful thing about the TD zero uh, goal? Oh, oh, I see, TD, well, TD zero goal, oh, yeah. No, like no, why? No. Why that is a natural? Oh, no, no. oh, I'm sorry. TD one is 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 where the elegance oh, TD1. is just. Okay. At TD one is the elegance. It's insanely beautiful. You're right. TD zero is not not as clear. That's true. Um, which would say maybe we should look at Q one. Well, <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm scared of that. Uh, no, no, yeah. Um, but even I would yeah. change uh, TD one. Uh, and then there is also this thing that. TD zero, if you're in a tabular setting, really just solves the model. So, so in a way, yeah. you can wave your hand yeah. a little bit here and there and justify yeah. these. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, I, I guess the theory is so much cleaner. And then TD one is has such a beautiful conclusion. It's a miracle that TD one solves what it does. So, um, so Q is known to be slow. It's I don't understand the the, the literature that well. But as far as I know, we don't know if a good exists in general. And, and the implications of solving this problem is not clear. And I think, so So please excuse my ignorance. I'm about to go into dangerous territory. I'm talking about something I don't know very much about. My perception is that people feel that DQN has, has helped to resolve that issue. Please, so don't, let's not have the discussion now because you know, I, I'm I'm really exposing myself because I don't know the literature that well. But but here's one sort of way to to write down D, uh, DQN using this sort of to try to fit things into what I've talked about before is that I look at the the mean square Bellman error over some uh, period. But note note note, I freeze my previous estimate theta n. Um, so you know, in particular, if I had a linear permutation, then take a look. This is linear. <laughs> you know, this would just be the most trivial quadratic program. You know, you know, this is quadratic. That's quadratic. That's. I mean, people use this with neural networks, so they're not solving quadratic programs. But you can see the beauty of this. You know, but the trouble is, and and you know, tell me later. This is probably well known. Um, uh, last month or July, I was doing an OD approximation of this, and it's identical to Q0 learning. So that they're identical, even for neural networks. So this is this is uh, Q0. So is that well known? Tell me later. Tell me later. Um, so let's uh, yeah, it's, it's probably well known. It must be because when you implement this, you see it. 
Um, I just couldn't find a reference before the, the presentation. So yeah, maybe you could put, put a tell everybody later. Um, so then, so it's, so it motivates looking at something different. So let's go let's go back to these LP approaches that have been talked about in, in recent days, and uh, and think about how that might lead to QLinear algorithms. And this is conjecture. You know, I, I I don't I will propose an algorithm. I don't know if it's any good or not, um, and uh, and we'll see. Okay. So first of all, I want to tell you what is the gold standard for an approximation. So what's a good criterion of fit? I'm going to tell you my opinion, OK? All right, so I've got this. So what I'm saying here is somebody gave me a, a function j, and I want to tell you that's a good j, or that's a bad j. Bad Shaba, bad Shaba, that's a bad j. <laughs> Shaba's the only person I can see. That's why I'm picking on him. Um, so, so inverse dynamic programming is this concept is that given any function j, any function j, <laughs> you can make a define a cost function. And you just take the you take the original cost function and you subtract off this error. You know. And all I'm doing is I'm taking that error. Let's do it use a different color. I'm taking the error, I'm putting it in here. And I'm taking this and I'm taking it out there, and that gives me this. <laughs> okay, so every every function solves a DP equation, perhaps with a crappy cost function. Right. But then you can say, well, did I do anything well? So I can take the policy that I get from this. So the, the policy obtained as the minimizer. All right. The, the arg min gives me a policy. Is that clear? And then I can look at the value function associated with that policy and excuse the double superscripts, as Eric said. Um, and the thing is, it's really trivial in a way. Um, if, for example, I have a lower bound on this error, if it's greater than minus some proportion of the cost function for all x and u, then my optimal value function, um, of course, is less than the value function for this stupid policy. That inequality is always true. You know. But then we have an upper bound as well. You know, So there's our gold standard. That's what we want. We, it's sort of a, uh, you know, that's it. So we have a gold standard, and it's also our first linear program constraint. Yeah. So looking at mean square Bellman error doesn't give us this. The only thing that gives us a performance guarantee is something like a linear programming constraint, where j is the variable here. You know, we don't have a parameterized family. j is just a variable, right? And it's a linear constraint. That is a linear constraint. You know, e is a fun e is a function of j, and uh, that's a linear constraint. Okay, so this comes to a well-known approach that was, I guess, first done by Mann in 1960s, and you can click these at yourselves to see other references. Um, you know, Ming, Ming Di Wong talked about this uh, on Monday. There's a wonderful thesis of uh, Daniela de Farias with Ben Van Roy. And sadly, she left MIT the day I arrived for my sabbatical in, in 2008 <laughs> to dance tango in New York. Um, and it's one way to derive these uh, semi-definite programming representations of LQR. Um, and you can, you can find every single month as a new application in the, in the control community. All right. I mean, just, I won't, I won't list them. Okay, so, I'm, so basically I take some probability measure on the state space, you know, X could be Rn and mu could be a Gaussian density. I don't know. Um, and uh, I have a inequality constraint that that uh, looks Bellman equation like. And uh, in this general setting, I would need continuity of J. And I, and in this total cost problem, I, I would need an equilibrium and J to be zero at the equilibrium. So uh, you can find details uh, in in those lecture notes that I sent to you all. 
All right. So this is this is this is known as an approach to approximate dynamic programming, typically model based. There's no queue. And whenever you don't see a queue, you should see a sad face. Right? Okay. So you can introduce a queue. So you cram in a queue. <laughs> so before I had J was less than this, I've just snuck in a queue here and here. You know, I'm just sandwiching, I'm saying Q is less than the thing I had before, but Q is also bigger than J. And then the same other assumptions. Um, and now I've got something that you can imagine. It's easy to make a model-based representation of error and you get Q, Q learning algorithms. Okay. Yeah. So um, this, um, this over-parameterization, as far as I know, it's my own work in 2009 with Prashant Mehta. Uh, and the reason we did it was just because of this. Um, you know, basically, we can observe this and then get a reinforcement learning algorithm. Okay. Okay. So how do you do it? Um, should I drive this? I wonder. What time is it? Yeah, it's, um, um... Yeah, it's two o'clock. Yeah, I'll do that. That's a, I don't have that much to say, so let's do it. So, so remember that we had that this was this was our this was our constraint for um, this is a classical thing. You know, no Q. So how how do you derive the classical result? Um, you know, you basically use the fact that those are my dynamics. That's exactly equal to that. You know, F defines my next state given my current state in action. Um, and you can iterate this, you know, and you get this. All right. Because I have j of time k compared to j of time k plus one. So you can iterate the equation and you get this. And um, so, yeah, this is useful to, to say. Um, so you, you have this for every t. And then you'd like to get t go to infinity. And what's the issue? I'm trying to get a bound on j. And the issue is that you don't know much about this. You know, as t goes to infinity, what's happening to this thing? But so this goes to zero for policies of interest. So basically, I'm going to only look at inputs for which I have stability. So my control problem is to try to get to the top of the hill and stay there. That's the equilibrium. And uh, so I'm going to basically, um, uh, you know, for any stabilizing policy, I get an upper bound. And the optimal policy is an example. So I can just go through it. I minimize this over all, all stabilizing policies. I get an upper bound. Um, so I take the infimum over all u. And I, by QED, I mean that j of x is less than or equal to j star of x for all feasible J, right? And so that's why you have to maximize, you know? You're always getting a lower bound on J. Um, sorry that I'm minimizing cost, everybody. Um, and so that's why you have to do something like this, you know, uh, introduce a, a weighting and, and a maximize. Okay, and that's it. So that's how you prove it. And then the the, the, the the Q learning flavor is just use a sandwich and things. So it's the same. It's the same thing. Questions? All good. We kind of believe you. Uh, there's some details, but yeah, yeah. But the but the biggest thing is the the reason for going over this is the fact right there that this equation is exactly the same as this equation. They're identical. It's it's a definition of a model. I guess I should keep writing down my model. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that should be that should have been in every slide. Sorry, everybody. Yeah. Okay. I had to copy that. I'll bet I'll need it again. Okay. Um, yeah. So so um, so it's obvious you can get a. I'll put it as a joke. 
it's, it's obvious to all of you that you can get a quadratic program, I hope, because what I can do is I can redefine my Bellman error as this linear function of my variables. <laughs> so Q and J are variables, if you like. They're, in a finite state space, in, act, you know, in action space, they'd be variables. They'd be like, you consider them as vectors. They're functions in general, so it's an infinite dimensional problem. But E is a linear function of Q and of J. And so when you square it, if you like, I get a linear function of, of Q and J. And I can take another probability measure, mu, mu there, and hit it by this thing. Um, and I won't change the problem at all because at an optimizer, this whole thing becomes zero. You know? So adding this term here is, is vacuous because the optimizer already satisfies that that's equal to zero. So um, there's no theorem here at all. You know? we, we already had, again, uh, E is, is identically zero for, uh, for the optimum. Um. I guess we'll see why you're doing this. Q base seems to be more complicated yeah. than P. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it, well, it, it, it's because of the fact that there's a regularization issue. I, I think a, a quadratic, I want the flexibility. I just, you know, there's a regularization issue in an algorithm. Um, and I, I so much, I want this to be zero and I want to try to encourage it. <laughs> and the LP might not give enough encouragement. Um, and constraints can be really hard to, uh, you know, constraints like this can be really hard to manage in algorithms, you know. So it's just another another uh, thing you can play with, right? You'll, you'll, um, yeah. It also reminds yeah, me yeah, of yeah. Lagrange that people do in optimization, right? They oh, yeah. take the constraint that they have, they square it, move it to the objective. They argue that the problem hasn't been changed. So this is kind of the same thing, right? Oh, that's right. And that, well, my motivation was all this, that theory and the theory of regularization and, and constrained optimization. It, it really came from those ideas, absolutely. And at one point, I had the positive part of this, the objective squared, which is also convex. Because um, you, you take a difference, positive part is convex, squared is convex. Um, and you can do that too. So you can you can do also put in all sorts of penalty terms to help regularize this problem. Yeah. Okay. And um, and I say the the um, the objective and constraints can be observed without a model. I should have put in my gold standard as well. <laughs> um, so you could do that as well. Okay. So let's. So yeah, this is cool. So. Um, I didn't have to feel rushed. So I'm just gonna go through and say, here's a possible Q learning algorithm, get out of this. One of you please come up with something better uh, by October, before Halloween, how's that? Um, so basically here is a, a model free, if you like, Q learning algorithm. And let's try to make sense of this. So don't worry, this is not an algorithm yet. I'm just trying to come up with something. So, um, so but a few things, a few warnings, okay? So I'd like this to hold, you know, this is, this is model free. And I'd like it to hold most of the time. It may be my parameterization is too small to make it hold every, for every K. You know, that's a question. This is, this is an open question. Now this is also model free because this is just a a um, a, a, a um, I'm going to impose this on my approximation architecture. So I did some experiments and I tried to enforce this using Monte Carlo blah blah blah. Forget it. It was too. It was unstable. It was just awful. So just construct uh, or maybe somebody will have a better idea. So I I failed to to do this without imposing it to the architecture. And it's related to advantage function of this. So is that, so for example, one way of doing this would be just to define J as the minimum in the U of Q, would that kill things? That ruins convexity, exactly. The whole thing is no longer convex. Yeah, this, yeah. Yeah, I guess, 
these days people are not that much concerned about that but yeah that would be yeah 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 um hmm. yeah okay that's true that's true good point that's a good point yeah um Oh, you couldn't have a wait, 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 wait. Um, oh no, no, you'd get really screwed if you define J to the minimum of Q, then you're back to Watkins. You know, Q zero Watkins. You you yeah, you can't you need the two two variables. Um, you'll you'll get this. Okay. You'll mm -hmm. just go back to DQM. Yeah. Um, okay. Now now here's what you know this um, this constraint. I wanted this to be non-negative. I'm going to relax that in the same way that we do these relaxations in Q-learning. I'm going to take this maybe high dimensional vector. So theta might be dimension a thousand, but this might be dimension a million. <laughs> you know, because it's an inequality constraint, I'm unbound. It can be as high dimension as you want. Um, and I've found in experiments, I do need to take it fairly high dimensional. And, um, and so basically, I replace this being true for every k with a with a Galactic relaxation, and you see that I'm copying the notation I used in the in DQN. I'm going to be looking at batches. Okay. All right. So this is this is a relaxation. Okay. And then, you know, of course, I have this funky thing up here. What the hell do I mean by that? Now, there I have to use an empirical average. So you replace this thing here with what the hell is that? By you look at the, the Bellman error at time k, square it, and take the average. <laughs> so here I can do it because it's convex. If, I mean, if, if you have a linear permutation, <laughs> it's convex. It's a neural network, it's not, but still. I'm, I still say there's a big difference, even if it's not convex, uh, between what I'm proposing here and DQM. Um, so here's an algorithm with those definitions. So um, I do a batch method, and I, I solve exactly this. Uh, um, this again, if it's a linear function approximation, this is a quadratic program, and I do a primal dual method. I'm not saying this is the only way to go again where I relax my constraints that this is greater equal to zero. Um, so you know, I have this constraint that that's equal to zero. I relax it through a Lagrange multiplier. Um, and this, the standard primal dual update is, is this thing here. All right. And it's, you know, and it seems to be, I don't know. I mean, this, this thing's not very old, so I don't, I can't tell you how great it is. All right. So, so there's one proposal one can try, and there it is. Any questions? I'm sure there must be. Okay. Um, so Sharon is and, asking. Uh, well, okay. Yeah. I have a couple more slides, but yep. Yeah. Sharon's asking we're penalizing twice once the average in the objective and then again via Z. Um, oh, wait. Hold on a second. Um, Yeah. Yes, we are. But that's the regularization question. Absolutely. So I don't know if it, I, 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 that's an open question. Setting this equal to zero. It seems to be fine, but I've done a total of two experiments. <laughs> I don't know anything. I just, I'm just saying there's lots of options here. Okay. So you're right. We're, we're, we're doing things twice. We've got, We've got, uh, but think about the slow start issues here. Like in the beginning, lambda means nothing at all. So this is sort of a surrogate for this uh, term here. You know, in the beginning, lambda means nothing. Um, yeah. My, my head is buzzing yeah. with with improvements of this. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> There's so many options. Yeah. Is that this is augmented Lagrangian, and so if you believe in augmented Lagrangian being a good thing, yeah. then it's a good thing. Yeah. Actually, I ran two experiments <laughs> in a similar setting 
<laughs> and the augmented Lagrangian always wins. It's just way, way better if you want to solve uh, these constraint problems. Um, yeah. So I'm very much with you. So, but, so everybody, um, the reason it's not, it's, it's not quite augmented Lagrangian because I okay. have an inequality constraint here. And here, I didn't take the positive part. <laughs> yeah. And my motivation is because I know that with equality here, it's also a valid quadratic program. Yeah. Over constrained if, um, if we can't, if, if we don't have the true value function in our, in our basis. So it's a, it's almost a augmented well, Lagrangian. Um, but okay, cool. That's yeah. Thank you very much. I, uh, uh, that's helpful. Anything else? I have a few more slides. Um, and yes, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's the learning rate. Yes. Yeah. It, and and but yeah. So the real question there, if if you were reading the question, is uh, if the learning rate is decreasing, that that term seems to be blowing up. Is it a problem? I started to type some answer, but you you better answer it no. online. Well, it turns out I, I wish I could write it down, but if you actually go through, suppose that so you notice I've got this uh, a constrained optimization. It's a quadratic program, but it, it does have, it's gonna have linear constraints be, in general or convex constraints because I, I'm going to impose a relationship between Q and J. Um, but if you write this down, um, take the gradient set equal to zero, you're gonna get something that looks just like stochastic approximation or, or, or an Euler scheme. I mean, this will end up looking like a game. Um, so the fact that it blows up, it's just like a, a vanishing game uh, in a uh, in a standard um, sta you know standard algorithm. Okay, um, you I mean you're gonna get you're gonna get theta n plus one equals some crazy function. Gradient of something, re something really complicated. You're gonna when you when you solve this minimization problem. <laughs> So it's so that that's why there's a one over alpha n plus one. Okay, cool. Um, so it's only four weeks old, everybody, you know, and I'd hope to work on this more, but NIPS ruined my life in July. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's like that's the optimal value function you'd get if you in, in Sutton's mountain car problem. And, you know, this was when I, I got tired in early August and said, I don't have time for this. <laughs> um, and it was, you know, not nearly enough time has been put into this. So I'm, I have no idea if this is gonna be an amazing breakthrough or just a cute comment. Um, but uh, but it, I'm doing this, I'm not wasting your time because the value, look what I got to explain. My feelings of shortcomings in Q learning, the way in which the LP approaches can be made into model-free reinforcement learning algorithms and a lot of potential directions for research. So I, I did not waste your time, I, I don't think, <laughs> even though this is very, I'm just, even though it's just a proposal. Um, so yeah, again, lessons learned, one again, is that this difference, again, I told you this already, but this is called the advantage function, the difference between Q and J, and again, I wasn't able to get anything to work without imposing this through uh, uh, the structure of the architecture. Um, uh, I think that there may be sensitivity to this. In LQR, there's not, it's trivial. You can just take in D dimensions, these points of support and, and you're done. That's an open question. Um, and a warning to everybody, I discovered in this, in trying to get things to work, but the main reason that some of these, these problems in open AI are hard is because they come from continuous time problems and they've translated discrete time with fast sampling. And what happens then is that this XK plus one is almost the same as XK. That's supposed to be an approximation symbol, right? And if, if this is almost the same as this, then that's J of XK and I've got a Q minus J, that's the advantage function. And so basically I'm trying to make that zero. That's not a good thing, making the advantage function, the cost function, no. <laughs> so 
the only reason I had trouble was the super fast sampling rate on OpenAI Gem. So I I know that if you if you go and look at things carefully in continuous time and come with really robust algorithms in continuous time, then go back and translate them, you'll get more robust algorithms. I, I feel that deep down in my soul, that's true. That, that you shouldn't you shouldn't settle with the continuous the the fast sample discrete time model is reality. We have a lot of flexibility in, in how we choose, well, how we implement these algorithms. I'll put it that way. Okay. Sean. Uh, uh, that's that's going to generate a lot of questions. Yep. A quick question about the choice of uh, ZN. How, how do you choose ZN? Oh, yeah. So I took, um, um, Z, yeah, let me, let me go back to that. That's important. Any, okay. Yeah. So what what I did? Um, so oh no no no. Uh, uh, yeah. Right there. Like yeah. so. Yeah. So so what so what I did is just this. I mean, the obvious thing that you might do is I basically took. Um, the case. Uh, you know, I I took so so. Um, um, it's an RBS. Yeah, so, so yeah, I take some yeah. I take some sort of a Gaussian kernel. So psi k plus its ith entry is equal to some Gaussian density. How about that? Gotcha. Um, yeah, that's that's one thing. I mean, of course, that I'm sure you know, and you, you could do simpler things. It's just you know, this is uh, that's one possibility. Um, it's interesting. It's kind yeah. of mixing uh, the linear representation and linear parameterization with this non-parametric ideas. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and the thing is, I'm most excited about trying this out for kernels because I in the in the uh, lecture notes I sent to all of you, there's a proposal to on how you do this for kernel methods, and it's uh, it's going to be fun to try out. Um, it's uh, hmm. yeah. Um, so yeah, so the so yeah again the the thing is that in the end the similarity to DQN is so compelling that people would think that I'm sort of reinventing something, but here we're solving potentially the gold standard <laughs> or try to approximate it. And the other thing, we don't know anything about it. You know, we don't yet know what this means, you know. Um, and someday we might have a better theory. You know, that's just uh, the current theory of Q learning is quite, is weak and it's going to improve. I know that. Okay. Um, you know, stochastic control is not a big deal, everybody. It's not a big deal. Uh, going from the what the deterministic theory is presented to you, the stochastic, I, that's not my concern. I think that the computer engineering is a concern. <laughs> you know, how did the most robust way to translate these ideas and algorithms is going to take some real, both the, the math RL people and the computer engineers will have to work together. Um, and I think it'd be so cool if there's a convex policy gradient, because after all, man didn't wasn't obsessed with value functions. He was obsessed with, uh, you know, with the probability on, on state action pairs. And so maybe we should be parameterizing occupancy probabilities and not the policy. You know, I mean, come on. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm half kidding. Okay. <laughs> no, no, the, the whole DRF <laughs> okay. is uh, raging. Are, are, are they okay? I didn't know that. Yeah, they are. I'm told it's well known. Uh, it's uh, it, it's a thing for sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So yeah, so I, I'm not aware of that literature, but um, but yeah. So the, and they didn't look at the dual, huh? That's funny. Yeah. I, I, to me, the reason I laugh is because coming up with a a, 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 a the convexity is out the window. I mean, how on earth are you going to come up with a proposal for a convex family of um, Occupancy probabilities, it's just, uh, that's all. But okay, so um, 
what I want to do that, so that, you know, so we're done with part one. Part two is all about quasi Sean and all these quasi stochastic approximation and and gradient descent methods and actor critic methods. Um, and what do I mean by the ODE method? And especially the ODE approximation of the BQN. So the next two hours are going to be diving deeply into that, but not, I won't be super technical. I'm, I have emergency exit buttons to jump out of anything scary. Um, so, and you can stop me as well. <laughs> but that's, uh, yeah. yeah. That's it, right? Yeah. And that's, okay. uh, there's, there's little Zapdos. More questions, come on. Uh, are you um, in the kayaks, in, in one of those kayaks uh, on the picture? Oh, man. Yeah, well, um, I do have friends uh, associated with each of these kayaks. This is rowing, actually, not kayaks. Yeah, this is actually rowing. Yeah, that's right. These are, this is rowing. Um, but there could be kayaks as well. Um, you know what this is on top? Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to be like Chris Watkins and wait till September 2020 to tell you that the Q function was just a random choice. You know what this beautiful sunset is? No. So, so my laptop had a, a clock speed of about 500 kilohertz, I think. And I had a, an M, a Q learning problem running. And when I woke up in the morning, it showed me this. It's a randomized policy. Nice. <laughs> Isn't that a, it's like a gift from Macintosh. <laughs> I so MATLAB created the colors and I I improved them a bit. But yeah. you know, probably the red means probably zero and the blue is probably one. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. yeah, so, so it's, it's a, I've always wanted a useless sunset and I finally found one. Yeah. But the boats were not there. No, no, no. That, yeah, this up, this upper rectangle is a randomized policy, uh, yeah. and and in June I was thinking, how do I make use of this? And I realized, if it's a sunset, I need an ocean before it. So, uh. I see. Uh, okay, there is a question in the meanwhile cool. in the chat. Uh, are actor-critic methods less prone to instability? They are locally optimal solutions, stochastic than value-based methods. Oh, wait, 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 wait. No, it seems like there's more than one question there. Um, so the, Active I'm critic. definitely not, yeah, you, I'm not the one to answer that question about the reliability of actor critic versus Q learning. Um, I'm definitely not the one, but I'm going to present some compelling results in the non-stochastic setting where I feel it kicks ass, you know, <laughs> um, for deterministic exploration. Mm -hmm. um, but I sure don't know. I, I don't have much expertise in experiments with actor critic. So maybe somebody else could, could chime in, you know. There are very strong opinions on what on you know favorite approaches to Q learning. Does anybody out there feel like actor critic is the only way to go? I know some people feel that way. I don't know, it's not me. Yeah. I mean all these approximations are useful, but uh, it seems to me that you can continuously interpolate between these algorithms. So it's not like this binary thing that either you do yeah. act or you do right, value based methods. It's like everything is like entangled. Uh, yeah. Maybe the question is whether instability would actually be a big problem with value based methods, let's say. Just focus on that because actor critic didn't quite oh, come up. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. No. Uh... Well, instability is an open problem for for um, for Watkins algorithm with with general function approximation or DQN, but for this algorithm, it's a piece of cake. Do is I it an open here? I think that or we do, do have examples that show that there is instability. Like oh no 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 oh no no that's not what I of course it's Bard's counter example. There the counter the examples where it doesn't work. Uh, what I mean is getting a general sufficient conditions for stability of Watkins algorithm with function approximation, the, the current solution conditions are just, they're just, they're, they're way, they're not nearly tight, I'm sure. Yeah, the, um, yeah. Do, do you think that we can ever get to some answer that you would be happy with in terms of, you know, like we would be happy with a sufficient and necessary condition, yeah. but 
isn't that too much to ask for? And if you're not oh, getting yeah. uh, conditions, then like, what are we doing? Like, uh, yeah, we can try to get better, uh, sufficient conditions, but um, yeah, I, I, I wish that. I mean, my dream would be to, to find a, a really robust way to reach my gold standard. Because I mean, that is what we want. We want, we want when you have a L, an LP type bound on the Bellman error, then you have a performance guarantee, you know, stability, mm -hmm. all sorts of things. You know, with these other things, it's just hard to see what you're doing. Um, you know, um, so I don't know if I'll ever be satisfied to answer, answer that. Um, uh -huh. Uh, so, and let me push on this uh, stability and stability. So there are multiple ways of defining stability. One would be just oh, yeah. that you know things don't blow up. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, like, do we actually? And I, I think that you were talking about convergence, right? Like actually converging. Uh, so what's your opinion? How important it is to design algorithms that converge under some uh, well-defined conditions? which are reasonable conditions, versus you could have an algorithm which, you know, chatters around, but uh, oh, yeah. but controlled, the errors are controlled. Oh, yeah, sure. No, yeah, I mean, I don't mind. I mean, I think yeah. that the main reason the mathematical side of RL, all, not all of it, one, one sector of the mathematical side of RL looks at vanishing gain algorithms because you can prove beautiful results. But in practice, I think that having you know chattering is is fine <laughs> you know um and 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 you, can, and you could always average at the end the polak rupert sort of thing um uh if, if you don't like the chattering you know <laughs> um so you know, i'm not worried about chattering but you want it but the thing is if there's chattering then there's a steady state and you'd like properties of steady state you'd like its mean to be close to what it sh you'd like it you know it should be um, things like that. Not too much chattering. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll even it, talk about that. In, in yeah. The okay. Uh, so in the meanwhile, on Discord, another super important question about the cover: um, huh? whether, whether the bird that is a Zabdos. Oh yes, of course. Oh, uh, by the way, this is this is stable because you can do an OD analysis of this. It's stable. Uh -huh. And Zapdos. Is right there, of course. That little bird uh, has been a friend for the last three years, uh, and that's sort of the uh, the trademark for Aditya Devaraj's thesis. Um, <laughs> on Zapp so, learning. Sean, let, let me just let me just say something, okay? So, uh, so so this is Gergay. Uh, so. Okay, uh, yeah. Let me just say that your talk just totally blew my mind, especially oh, this, no. <laughs> this part where you introduce the Q function in the linear program. Yeah. Because this is something that I just discovered this spring. I don't know, I was just oh. noodling around with the LPs. Oh, oh, funny, yeah. And so, so this really just changed my world in every possible sense. I mean, oh. when it comes to like reinforcement learning, <laughs> yeah. that is. Yeah. Because before that, you know, I mean, I'm 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 a little bit of an LP fundamentalist, yeah, uh, yeah. which is like you know whatever can be explained in this LP framework exists <laughs> in MDPs and everything else is fiction. Uh -huh. And well, and I was well, like, the thing is, it's such a beautiful tool for analysis. It's amazing. Yeah, 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 totally. And and I was yeah, like, yeah. Q functions do not make any sense because yeah. there's no Q functions in this LP, right? Yeah, so right, I was right, like right. Trying to like <laughs> play around with it, and then yeah. I came to the exact same formulation as you did. Oh, Except yeah, yeah. that I think that uh, replacing one of the inequality constraints with an equality constraint yeah. has some advantages. Yeah, and I actually yeah, derived you, some you algorithms it, from yeah. this. Uh -huh. uh, so I was like, sort of like interrupted also by this NORIPS deadline. Yeah. So some, some horribly like mutilated version of this LP appears in one of my NORIPS submissions. Oh, really? <laughs> and but like regarding also this kind of penalized Lagrangians and introducing these regularization terms. So like, yeah, yeah I mean, I've, I've been going through like exactly oh, through fine. the same oh, loops. That's awesome. so, we, should, we, we have to keep the conversation going. That's yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, like, We're gonna have yeah. something to talk about in this coming months because this is yeah, that's completely awesome. fascinating, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's the thing. I, I was so excited about Q 
getting some feedback because it's uh, so you know again we had a version of this in continuous time in 2009 and uh -huh. it was like and we laughed at ourselves because we didn't you know i in my mind rl is about algorithms you know theta n plus one equals theta n plus yeah. four and and i didn't have the dqn batch mindset and without that it's a mess it's just too trying to make this into a recursive standard you know, it, it's just it's 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 not possible. So we, oh, oh yeah, that that mean field game thing was from that paper. So we applied it to mean field uh. games, and um, so we were able to to make it work. But the LP um, was hard to manage at the time, um, just because we were conservative. We we had a a view of what algorithms should look like. Um, yeah. So my idea of deriving yeah. algorithms is usually like coming from the perspective of the dual of this yeah because because from the dual you can just like impose like different kinds of regularization and derive like a bunch of different algorithms from it this is something that i yeah. really love to do and yeah. like once yeah. you introduce this extra constraint in the dual as well yeah. like once that you know once in the in your primal you include uh, an inequality constraint you can have an unconstrained variable in the dual Oh, okay. Yep. yep. And, and for that, sudden, okay. So my other pet peeve is that the squared loss does not make any sense, right? Yeah. So just like the Q function. Yeah. But once you have an unconstrained variable, then the squared loss suddenly starts to make sense. Mm -hmm. And for me, you know, this is all coming together. I can go on forever like this. I don't think uh -huh. that is interesting for, oh, oh, for other oh, people. Oh, I see. Yeah. 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 That's fine, though. Oh, right. 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 So, yeah, we, we need to totally talk about this later. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Okay, so there. Yeah. 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 yeah so, so thanks for sharing your thoughts. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thanks for the feedback. That's fun. Great comments, uh, Gergo. Uh, it, it seems that multiple people are coming to your similar ideas recently. So Nuya was sending a message in the chat. Uh, the day also had some LP formulation with Q functions in an earlier work. Uh, okay. So there will be something to discuss about later, and. Yeah. Uh, also, she's asking whether extending to stochastic control would present some challenges with this. Uh, you know, like you have an error type of quantity uh, in expectation there, and then yeah. squaring. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I, yeah, I have two answers to that. So, so without the penalty, it's it's completely trivial. So this 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 presents problems in a stochastic framework. Yeah. Um, yes, indeed. So, so you'll have to kill it or, or come up with something else. Um, well, you wanted to be. Yeah. What's up? Yeah. So there's, there's also it's also the tricks to do with that. Yes, you can use it. Yeah, you know, yeah, you can use what are they called again? Belief buckets. Or <laughs> the, uh, um, you can use empirical models. Also, there's a million ways you can deal with it. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, you can't you can't take this off the shelf. But there's lots of ways to to, to come up with algorithms. I think uh, I cut you off. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So can we have one more question, maybe? Uh, and then we should let people go. Um, so the question is, uh, in general sense, what is the advantage of construct con constructing a problem in terms of Solving an HEB equation with this iterative RL. I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, whoever asked it, it was an anonymous attendee. Uh, if if you want to refine your question, I'm, I don't know whether Sean, you understand uh, the question. Yeah, Maybe this person's okay. actually read this paper <laughs> because that's what this is about. Oh, okay, there you go. So, oops, obviously I revealed um, my spot. So then, so, but but the advantage I think is because of this issue of fast sampling, is that basically fast sampling in continuous time, it's like the problem's differentiation. Mm -hmm. There's no problem. You know, well, that, you can't that, differentiate that, your measurements, okay, and so. Okay. So most of our paper was about how to come up with new DP equations in which we, we could take in average uh, data and then get it and get a unbiased uh, 
algorithm. Um, so I think you can import, and this, this is a great example of ODEs. Calculus is beautiful, I'm sorry. LPs are beautiful, <laughs> but so is calculus. <laughs> By spending so much time to continuous time case, I think there's all sorts of tricks to, to justify averaging data and solve the exact uh, DP equation. <laughs> okay, so, um, them, so that, that's a potential answer to that question. <laughs> it's an answer to some question. I uh, do have um, a follow-up question to this then, which is that, okay, so um, if fast sampling happens to be the case, uh, then maybe that suggests that you should be uh, approximating gradients of the value function. Uh, Right, like uh, how far, like wh what is the direction of change of uh, oh, the value? Um, and that's basically the HEB thing. But I have okay. the feeling that we should we should do it in a in a smooth way, so that like you don't need to know whether you are in this scenario or that scenario. Like I'm like the system is just discrete time, and maybe you need this representation or that. Um, yeah. So have you? Do you have any thoughts about this? Hmm. Am I completely yeah, um, um It's it's a fun question, but I don't. Um, it's so funny because that's actually part of. So so estimating the gradient. Um, the gradient. Oh no, we look with respect to x, not. Yeah, usually that's even. X about this, then there is continuous uh -huh. space and, and you're estimating yeah, yeah, yeah. respect to. Yeah, no, I, don't, I don't know what to, I, I don't know if that'd be useful or not. It's a quite, it's interesting. I, I right. don't have an answer. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's curious. Okay. Good. Uh, thanks, uh, Sean. Uh, okay. So let's break up an or. Um, and we'll come back after the break. Uh, and the break, yeah, I can check the schedule myself. Okay, thank you. Oh, by the way, Sean, uh, did you post your slides for this part? Uh, on no, Discord? no, I can, I, I can post all four right now. Should I, where should I send it? A Discord? Oh, or? Discord discussion channel for the workshop. Uh, okay, all right. If you I'll have right a problem, yeah, just let me know. I'll, I'll, but I'll just, I'll just uh, use Dropbox. So. And then post the links. Yeah, that's okay. good. All right, right, cool. All right, see you later.